Well, if you got your Bible, go ahead and open up this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And today, I just want to begin to prepare us. As we're fixing to step into 21 days of prayer, uh, I want to begin just to prepare your hearts. And in fact, I know this, that many of us uh, growing up, maybe, maybe some of you, you grew up in church. Maybe uh, in your family, y'all were strong in prayer. And so you're very comfortable in pray- praying. Maybe some of you, maybe you're new to faith, and maybe you, this whole prayer thing, you, you're still trying to figure it out. You, you understand that you're talking to God, but it's kind of like, man, I, when I talk, I, it, does he hear me? I'm not hearing nothing back. And so sometimes you kind of have these weird feelings, or especially if you're ever asked to pray with other people, and there's this feeling of, what do I do, kind of thing. And, and how many of y'all remember the, the good old, back in the days, those of you who are Kind of around my age, if you remember, see at the pole was a huge thing. And we'd always meet at the school campuses in September and circle around and make the, the prayer circles and pray. And y'all remember the squeeze the hand where somebody would come around and they, they would pray. They'd squeeze the hand to pass the prayer around. Are y'all with me this morning? And, and how many of y'all were the ones that it just bypassed? You, you squeeze, squeeze real quick, right? You, you would want them prayer to just to keep on moving. Because maybe you were timid or maybe, maybe somebody else prayed your prayer, Right? And so whatever, whatever your situation may be, uh, today this is what I want to do is I, I want you to see the importance of prayer, but two, I want to I help teach you how to pray. And just to help you give a basis, a, a starting place, a foundation, because over the next 21 days, this is what I'm believing for. If you'll just take this model, in fact, it's Jesus' model, if you'll take this model and, and some of the instruction I want to give you this morning, I, I, I personally believe that's going to help your prayer life to begin to grow. I believe that's what's going to happen is that in your time of prayer and the intimacy in your prayer, you're going to begin to see some response out of it. You're going to feel, you're going to come out of your prayer time with the Lord feeling like something got accomplished. Amen? And this, this is what I want you to catch right off the bat. Listen to me. God wants to commune with you. He wants to, he doesn't just want to hear from you but he wants you to hear from him. And so here's the beauty. Prayer is our direct connection of communion with God. Now we know this, the word of God is his word, literal word spoken to us. Inerrant, infallible, it's absolute authority. And so if you ever need a word from God, this is a very good place to start. Amen. If you ever need a word, I'll give you a word. Just there's the word, all right? It's, it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit. So here's the beauty. If you need to hear from the Lord, this is the great place to start. But here's the thing is, I don't want the relationship and the communication to be one-sided. We want to open up and begin to speak to the Lord and begin to have conversation. And this is what happens. As you begin to mix his word, written word, and your conversational prayer to the Lord, all of a sudden, what will begin to happen is that mix in the Holy Spirit, you'll begin to hear the voice of God speak to you. But here's the thing is you can never hear the voice of God unless you know how he speaks. How do we know how he speaks? Oh, look at it. It's even glowing. Look at that. It's amazing, right? It's, it's through the word of God. And so when we learn how he speaks, and as we begin to have conversation, next thing you'll do, you'll begin to hear that still small voice as you te- dedicate time to get along with him. All of a sudden, he'll begin to speak, and you'll know it's him because it's affirmed by his word. Y'all with me? How do we know the difference between the pizza Friday night and God speaking Saturday morning? The word of God. Amen? And so just to kind of help you out, first and foremost, our main text is this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. It says, always be joyful. One of our values here is this, we choose joy. Y'all realize when you wake up in the morning, I don't care what side of the bed you roll off of, you can decide what kind of attitude you're going to have. Come on, somebody. We choose joy, so always be joyful. Never stop praying. Older translation, our older translations, like the, if you read New King James or King James, I think even ESV, it, it'll say this. It says, never cease in your prayer. Don't cease in prayer. Continually pray. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. How many of you want to do the will of God? 
How many of you want to fulfill that in your life? Well, here's the place where we start, one, with the value and the attitude where we decide it doesn't matter the circumstances of my life. I'm going to choose joy. I'm going to make a decision that when I get out of bed, my response is this, another day to live. And so, Lord, today I choose joy. But out of it, not just that, but a heart of gratitude and a place of continually praying, never ceasing in prayer, that we continue to allow the Spirit to pray in and through us. But not only that, we also pray with words of knowledge, that we speak to the Lord, that we commune with Him. Many of you, if you remember during your high school days, I think most of us during test times, that's probably when our greatest level of prayer uh, started. That's whenever intercession began was whenever you were in grade school or high school and you were interceding because you didn't study, you didn't prepare, and all of a sudden you showed up as class hoping, if you were a believer, that God was going to pull through for you somehow, and so you interceded on behalf of yourself. Dear God, help me to pass this grade because I don't want to repeat this grade, right? But then all of a sudden life happens and then all of a sudden you you maybe you get married and you have kids and then all of a sudden you begin to hold another level of intercession. Dear Lord, or maybe for you women it was at marriage, you said, dear Lord, help me not to kill this man, right? And then all of a sudden you have kids and intercession starts up where it's, dear Lord, please help me with these kids, right? And then all of a sudden as they get older, it's, Lord, please protect my kids because they're starting to drive. And all of a sudden, when they transition, they begin to move out. Lord, please watch over. Help me to let my kids go. And all these, right? There's an engagement within our life. But this is the reality is this, is that prayer is so much more than just calling on God in desperate times of need. In fact, the greatest thing that about our prayer life is that it can be relational. That just like your relationship with a dear friend or with your spouse, you can commune, you can talk, you can fellowship with God Almighty. You can have times of expressing deep, intimate thoughts and and concerns and heart, passions and desires with the Lord. There's the beauty is this, Scripture says that He's the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And because he's the one who's close, he desires that close connection and relationship. And like I said earlier, it's not just one-sided where we just glean from him through his word, but we can communicate to him through prayer. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? He says, pray always. Never stop praying. In fact, there's a strong word whenever uh, we see in 2 Chronicles where all of a sudden, uh, same, uh, whenever God, man of God's calling out to the Lord and saying, Lord, whenever trials and tribulations happen, whenever there's destruction and whenever the enemies rise up against us, if we call on you, would you hear us when we pray? If we, we repent, would you forgive us? And the Lord responds. And look what he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13. At times I might shut up heavens so that no rain falls, and command grasshoppers to devour your crops and send plagues among you. Then, if my people who are called by my name, simply means this, if believers, if people who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, now we know directly here, he's speaking to the Israelites, but I want to tell you something, his word's for you too today, and so it relates to you as a believer. Look what he says. Those who are believers, who put their trust in God, if they'll humble themselves and pray. If they'll pray. What does that mean? If they'll just call out to me. If they'll commune with me. If they'll talk to me. This is what he says. And if they'll seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, if they'll repent, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their lands. Listen, this was a response to prayer. This was a response to the cry of the man where they said, God, would you respond? Would you do this? And he said, yes, I will if you'll just pray. If you'll pray. So prayer is vital. In fact, we see this with the disciples in Luke and also in Luke chapter 11, also in Matthew chapter 6. Now I want to remind you, the disciples who followed Jesus, when they came, these guys, some of them, though they were fishermen, In their culture, they were taught the word of God. 
As Jews, they were taught the Torah. They, were, they knew the word of God. Not only that, but as they grew in it, they were taught prayers. They learned prayers in their faith. But all of a sudden, there was something different whenever they saw the rabbi, Jesus, and how he prayed. In fact, here we see their, their desire come into fruition. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It says, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, they noticed him. They saw him as he is in this place praying. And as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. How many of y'all have ever been, have, have a friend or maybe you've been around somebody that when they pray, you're like, wow, man, they're moving mountains. Man, you're like, man, I'd like to pray like that. Anybody ever have that? Right? I mean, those people that you're like, come on, somebody. Man, heaven just fell in this room kind of thing. Well, well that just doesn't happen overnight. But yet, somehow in their life, they begin to learn how to pray. And it's the same thing here. I believe the disciple as saw how God had Jesus pray, it moved their heart. It caused them to go, I, I've been taught one way to pray, but t- teach me to pray like how you pray. I want to pray like that. In fact, we see the exact same thing in Matthew, the same account, Matthew chapter 6. And this is Jesus' response. And this is what he says. He doesn't say, listen, here's the formula. He doesn't say, I want you to repeat after me. No, 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 no. He says, let me just give you a model. Let me give you a basis, a starting point. Let me just give you some guidelines or some some references to help you to progress in your prayer. Look what he says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now look, in your scripture, you'll see where there's commas here. And so this is already breaking down. There's seven different areas that he says to focus on. He's this recognition, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that look at the name of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the next one. Give us today our daily bread. The next one, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And look at this way, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What a powerful prayer. And many times we look at, I look at this and I think, man, this is actually a pretty simple prayer, even to the point where many of us have memorized this. This becomes kind of a prayer that we may pray on a regular basis. But I want you to look at this because here's the thing. Jesus was very uh, direct in, in teaching on prayer. And he, he made this statement. He said, don't be repetitious. Don't just begin to repeat prayers that someone else has written and don't don't get into a religious format. No, no, no. There's a relational relational connection in this. In fact, I want you to look at this as we break this prayer down, kind of to help you. And I can do this quickly this morning. This will just help you to kind of begin to set a pace for your prayer life. First thing that he says is this, our Father in heaven. I want you to write this down. Connect with God relationally. This place of recognizing that this isn't just God Almighty, however he is. This isn't just the creator of the universe, however he is. But friend, I want to tell you something. He's Abba, Father. He's close. He's present. He's not a God who's afar off, who's created everything and says, you must serve me. No. He's a God who's close and present. Who knows your very name. Come on. He knows every detail about your life. Here's the thing. He desires the same thing that you should desire. Relational. Relationship. Connection with one another. And here's the beauty because of what Jesus did upon the cross. God paid way that he wouldn't just be a supreme authority. Creator of all. But that he could be relational with his creation. He paved way through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross. The veil, because sin was once and forever paid for, the veil to the temple was rent. It was torn. And because it was torn, it opened up access through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus that we can go directly to the throne of God. Come on. Man, that we can have close relationship with God the Father. 
even the more so, he can be your father. And listen, oftentimes in our culture, over the last, goodness, last 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of talking around about generational curses and about fathers. And, and I know that in our culture, there's been a lot of disappointments that have happened because of maybe fathers who didn't father well. But I want to tell you something. Do not equate your earthly father to your heavenly father. Your heavenly father is perfect in every way. Come on, somebody. He, 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 he's concerned about you. He loves you deeply. I'll never forget a conference I was at. It's actually at Gateway Church in Dallas, Texas. Back years ago, it was before I, was, before I moved to Sherman. I was going through a time in my life, and listen, I had, I had a, a great earthly father. My dad, man, top notch. Love my dad. He's my hero. And I, I tell you something, but even in that, there was something in me that I desired affirmation. And my dad did a good job affirming me in life. I never had a problem with that. But there was something that, man, I just, I long for affirmation from leadership in my life. I'll never forget sitting there at Gateway Church. In fact, I, I, Jim, Jimmy Evans was preaching, phenomenal message. And somewhere in the midst of it, all of a sudden, it was like all of a sudden just me and God was the only ones in the room. And I no longer knew what was taking place there. All I know what was taking place in the moment. And in that moment, I just, I just sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit and the Father affirm me as a son. I want to tell you something. That moment has helped me for years to come. In times when I felt betrayed, hurt, left out, when I felt abused, when I, all those feelings that we go through, alone, I've always remembered my Heavenly Father affirming me as His child. Now I want to tell you something. Your Heavenly Father, He doesn't want to be a God who's afar off. No, 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 no. He's paid way to be near and present. This morning, no matter what's going on in your life, you can begin to experience that kind of relationship with your Heavenly Father. You can begin to grow close to Him, to connect with God relationally, not formally, but relationally close. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 15. It says, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Now, are we slaves of God as children? Yes, we are, but by choice. Come on, somebody. But listen, not fearful slaves. No, no, no. Instead, you receive God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. My, my, my. I like that last line. Now we call Him Abba Father. See, He's a Father who's close and present to His children. He'll never leave you. He'll never abandon you. He is God with my, my, my. Our Heavenly Father. Second truth is this. Look what he says. Hallowed be your name. Listen, the, the greatest thing in your prayer life is a place where not first and foremost where you come and you just spend time with Abba Father. Spend time in His presence relationally. Acknowledging Him as your Father. Not God afar off, but God who's present and close. But not only that, his name is to be worshipped. His name is awe. His name is mighty. His name is holy. In fact, whenever I, I teach on prayer, the, the acts, adoration, confession, uh, thanksgiving, and supplication, when I teach that model of prayer, this is the key thing, that adoration is whenever we begin to acknowledge who he is. Long before we ever acknowledge anything about us, it's to remind us. He knows who he is. Come on, somebody. It's us reminding us who he is. And when we begin to declare his name, listen, it reminds us that he's more than able. I want you to think about this. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18 tells us this. God's name is a place of protection. The righteous can run there and be safe. Aren't you thankful for the name of God? Let me give you a couple of them this morning just to kind of think they won't be on the screens, but you can write these down. He's righteousness. 
We are now the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. He's righteousness. He's Jehovah Sikhanu. Listen, he's our healer. Man, he is the, the, the healer. He's the one who heals our soul. He's the one who heals our mortal body. He's the one who provides a Jehovah Rapha, our healer. But not only that, he's also your shepherd. He is Jehovah Ra. He is the one who guides you, who leads you beside still waters. He is your pastor. Not only that, he's our provider, Jehovah Jireh. He provides. He's more than able. He sustains us. He provides the very breath that we breathe. He provides the joy. Scripture says, listen, if you need joy, he provides it. Scripture says he is our joy. He makes our joy full. Why? Because he fills us with his spirit. It's because of the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross. And because of the the spirit, you every day can live a life joyfully. He's our joy. He's our provider. He's our sanctifier. He's the one who sanctifies us. He set us aside for something special. Listen, every single one of you in this room has a calling. Every single one of you in this room has a purpose. You know why? Because your heavenly Father has created you with purpose, with reason. He has, desi- he has sanctified you as a believer for purpose. And here's the beauty. Whenever you grasp the truth of the gospel and you say yes to King Jesus, all of a sudden you can begin to walk in line with that which he created you for. Amen? All that, but he's our banner of victory. Jehovah Nisi, he's our defender. He protects, he watches over you, he keeps you. And so in our prayer, it's a response of just reminding, Lord, thank you that you're Jehovah Nisi, that you're my banner of victory. Lord, that I've got the victory because I'm a child. I'm your child. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. Oh, this is a good one. He's your peace. He is our peace, who has broken down every wall. He is our Jehovah Shalom. Listen, I want you to catch this. God does not give you peace. He is the peace you receive. So when you receive him as father, as you trust in him through his son Jesus, friend, I want to tell you something. All of a sudden, peace abides. You just need to remind yourself you've already got it. You need to take your focus off the troubles and the woes of this world. And in your prayer, begin to remind yourself, Lord, you are my Jehovah Shalom. You are my peace. Lord, it doesn't matter the things that I hear outside in the tangible world. Oh, I live by the Spirit of God. And so my focus is back on you. So I'm going to remind myself who you are as my sanctifier, as my healer, as, as my reward. I'm going to remind myself that you're my peace. But not only that, listen, I want you to catch this. He's also Jehovah Shammah, which is this. He's the constant companion, meaning this, he's there. You know what that means? Whenever you go there, guess where he's at? He's there. He's always with us. He says he will never leave you nor forsake you. So why is it so important that we pray his name? Why is it? Because you need to remind yourself who he is so you can know who you are. My, my, my. Let me tell you something. When you begin to understand the names of God, and you begin to understand and you begin to worship his name. You begin to, that hallowed is your name. I begin to worship him. My place is reminding myself, he's got this. He's able. So later on when we begin to get with the troubles, in fact, this is what you're going to find out. All of a sudden the things that you thought were troubles, you begin to remind yourself who your daddy is. Friend, I want to tell you something. Faith rises up above the troubles. Come on, somebody. That's some good preaching. Third truth is this. Look what he says. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want you to write this down. Simply pray his agenda first. Pray his agenda first. Oftentimes in prayer, we become very selfish. Our focus is on me, my problems, my woes. Oh, dear God, I've got to make it through this day. Can you help me? And out of that, this is the problem When we focus on our problem, we forsake his promise. 
when we get so consumed with our promise, problems, it will overshadow in our mind, in our heart, his promise, his word, which is yes and amen. Doesn't change it. No, no, no. It just causes us to miss, uh, it causes us to, to no longer see it in our natural eye. And so we get, over, we get overwhelmed and consumed by the woes and the trials. But here's the thing. When you begin to reflect on who he is, reminding yourself that he's near and present, that he's there. But not only that, you move from a place where you're worshiping him to a place where all of a sudden you begin to pray his agenda and you make what's priority to him priority to you. Let me help you out this morning. If you ever wanted to know what God's prayer list is, I'm going to give it to you in one word. You ready? Others. Others. See, God is about people. His heartbeat beats for you. His heartbeat beats for me. His heartbeat beats for everyone in this room, for every person outside these four walls. And our response is this place of saying, God, how can I pray for others? I, I, one one uh, minister that, that I love to follow and I, I love to, I go, my, Ethan and I go to his leadership conference every year. It's Gerald Brooks over here in Plano. And he's just an incredible, incredible leader. He sits on the board for John Maxwell and just, he is, uh, he's just an incredible teacher. Uh, and, and out of it, he, makes, he made this statement a couple years ago. He asked this question. He says, how many of you have ever asked the Lord what he wanted you to pray about? I had never thought about that. Every time in my prayer life, it's always been me coming with prayers of needs and concerns and woes or praying for others even. But in that moment, I thought, man, Lord, help me to change my prayer life to where I begin to pray what you want prayer, prayed. Help me to pray your will. We say it, thy will be done, but we say thy will be done right here on earth. But have we ever asked him what's his will? Lord, what do you want me to pray about? What, what's on your heart today? Let me help you. Others, those who are lost, those who are forsaken, those who are distraught, those who are being abandoned. Man, our prayer and our response is when we begin to say, God, I want to seek after you. Matthew chapter 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. I like in Luke, same reference here, Luke chapter 12, verse 31. It says, he will always give you all you need from day to day if you will make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Changing the focus in your prayer life Instead of being about me, myself, and I, what I need, what I want to God, what's your heartbeat? What do you want me to pray today? Who do you need me to intercede on behalf of? Who else needs something today? Who can I pray for? That our heartbeat begins to take on the heartbeat of our Father, the needs of others over ourselves. Look at the fourth truth. He says this is, give us this day our daily bread. This is depending on him for everything. A place where we say, in everything in my life, I'm going to look to God to be my sustainer. For him to be my provider. Now this doesn't mean that we become lazy and that all of a sudden we, we sit on the couch and eat potato chips and go through our, best, our favorite Netflix all day long. And go, well, God's just going to have to provide. No. No, no, no. This is a place where all of a sudden we recognize that all that we need is sustained through him. We still have obligation and responsibilities to everything within our, our, our abilities of the strength that he's given us, the resources that we've gained for his glory. But I want to tell you something. He always sustains. He always provides. Psalms 121 says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth next truth as far as in our model of prayer is that we go from a place to where we acknowledge him as our father a place where we're worshiping him his name and maybe in that time you may do that with some worship music and just focus in as you get that time alone with god then you move into a place where you begin to begin to pray his agenda pray on behalf of others a place where you surrender and recognize that all you need is found in him to ultimately come to a place where he says, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
I think this is vital because we live in a culture to where oftentimes we think we don't need to repent because we're already forgiven. That is a dangerous, friend, a dangerous perspective. Here's the reality. Jesus said that he even came for men to repent, to preach the gospel. Paul, both Paul and Peter, they called and said for men to repent. So repentance is a key element, not just one and done, but that we continually be in a place of humility where we acknowledge our need to surrender to his lordship. Repentance is not for God's benefit, it's for yours. He's already paved way. You've heard me say this. You don't need faith to repent. You don't need, well, you need faith to repent. You don't need, you, you need faith to believe though. You need faith. You don't need forgiveness. He's already provided that. But you need faith to simply believe, to receive the forgiveness. And here's the thing. When we repent, it's position our hearts in humility and surrender to his lordship continually. I repent daily. You know why? Because I know me. I know that there's things that I probably do that can bring offense to other people. And scripture says if I've offended my brother, I'm in the wrong. There's things that I may do subconsciously, things I may do not thinking, that may be just simply simple. In a place where I constantly want to be in a place saying, Lord, forgive me. If I've done something, both those things that I know, and maybe even the things that I don't realize yet. Because here's the beauty, the Holy Spirit will work on you. He'll poke and prod. He'll help you to get your heart right with God and with people. You see, repentance is not just repenting to God who you sin against, but it's also repenting to the people who you hurt. Because listen, friends, sin is always destructive. Not only will it destroy you, but it'll always destroy, it has ripple effects. It'll hurt and destroy others around you. So repentance, a place where we call out to it, forgive us of our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Not just a place of calling out to Him, but also a place of, not, of receiving repentance from those of even those who have not repented to you. Look what He says in John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness as the worship team comes. Sixth truth is this. He says, and do not lead us into, into, into temptation. In which reality we understand this. God never leads us into temptation. That's actually a poor translation coming from the Greek. But I want you to catch this, or from the, the Hebrew, but uh, this from the Greek. This is what I want you to catch. The reality is what he's saying is, Lord, protect me from whenever temptation comes. Pro- protect me. Help me not to give in to temptation. God will not tempt you. Everybody look at me. You need to understand this. God does not tempt you. With evil. He does not tempt you to say no to him. He does not tempt you to turn from righteousness. But the truth is this we need his Holy Spirit to say no to temptation when it rises. When the evil one, the devil, comes against us. When temptation creeps up, we need a protector. We need King Jesus to help us by the power of the Holy Spirit. To say no. That's the truth of what he's saying here. That we engage in spiritual warfare in our life. That we recognize that this life that we live is not what we think it is in all the physical aspects of it here on earth. But there are spiritual wars taking place in the heavenly realms. That our place of what we're engaging is is much more than just this tangible flesh. Scripture calls us and tells us to live by the Spirit. Not to live according to the flesh. Because listen, the spirit and the flesh are fighting for the soul. And if you, whichever one you feed, whichever one you give into is the one that's going to win. If you're led by the spirit, you'll live in righteousness through Christ Jesus. If you yield to the flesh, you'll continually give in to the sinful nature of man. The desires of the flesh. That's why Paul says flee from your youthful desires. Flee from the things that your flesh craves. But you know what? It's so easy whenever the tangible is so accessible for us to yield to that. 
And I want to encourage you. We're called to be people of the Spirit. I want to encourage you in your prayer life. Make it spiritual. Do business with heaven. Get close to the Father. Allow your focus be upon Him, His face. Draw close in humility. Acknowledging who He is. With a heart yielded to His desires. Man, with a repentant heart, recognizing that you're fallible. However, you serve an infallible God. Recognizing you need Him. Not only that, but as He works in you, you also allow Him, which He's done for you by showing His mercy and grace and His forgiveness. You manifest that through your life towards others. Ultimately leads us to this other truth, the last one. I love what, what, what Jesus does here. He comes back around and ties it right back into where he started. And in this, he expresses faith in God, in God's ability. Look what he says. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God, Father, I recognize I need you in all areas of my life. You're able. And so even with all my forgiveness, all my woes, all my worries, I come back to you to rhyme myself. I pursue you. You're more than able. Love these two passages. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. It says, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing's too hard for our God. He's able. In fact, he's more than able. Last passage, we'll close. Revelation 5, verse 13. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. A place within our prayer life that we can draw close, a simple model and if you take note here, this is what you catch. It takes a lot of the emphasis off of us and puts it heavy upon Him. It removes the burden on us and it puts the trust in Him. And see, friend, let me tell you something. If you could fix your life, you would have already done it. If you could sustain your life, you would have already figured out how to sell that by now. But you can't. You need Jesus. And today, your Heavenly Father, listen, He's not far off, but He's simply just one step of faith away from whenever you move from a place of trusting yourself to where you acknowledge who He is. He's sovereign. He's holy. He's mighty. And through His Son, Jesus, believing that God truly is who He says He is, and that Jesus is Lord, His one and only Son, believing that He died on a cross after being living a sinless life, that not only did He die, but on the third day He rose victoriously. On His part, acknowledging who He is, then also acknowledging who you are, a sinner that you can't do anything to save yourself that you've missed the mark that you're wicked friend and listen it's by your own doings of sinfulness not towards man but towards God and today the father doesn't stand in a place to rebuke you but he stands with arms wide open and tears in his eyes because he sees you coming across the field. He's called your name and today he's asking you to just simply come home. And your response of faith is instead of rejecting him and walking away, today could be your day that you embrace your heavenly father through faith in his son Jesus. How do I do that, pastor? It's called salvation. It's where you simply believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart 
that he's Lord. That God raised him from the dead. And you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord of your life. You're saved. By believing, one is able to move into righteousness. But listen, by confession of Jesus, you're saved. That he's alive. That he's Lord of your life. Today, you can experience the extravagant love of the Father. If you're here this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed, you're saying, Pastor Nathan, I don't just want to have a prayer life, but I want to have a relationship with God. And I'm ready today for that to begin. This is your moment, friend. If that's you, would you simply raise your hand up so I know who I'm praying with this morning? If that's you this morning, you're saying, I'm ready to make a decision to follow Jesus. Anybody? all across this room. Maybe today you're in a place where you need to rededicate your life. Maybe you've grown cold in your relationship. Maybe even in your life you find yourself kind of just stagnant. You're trying to just go through the models. You believe, but man, it's just, your relationship has gone cold. Today's the day to make a new commitment. Today's the day to say, Lord, I, I know you love me. Today, I just want to affirm my love to you. If that's you, I just, you slip your hand up. I want to pray with you this morning. Today, you're going to make a decision and say, God, I'm ready to draw close to you. I'm there afar. I thought we had, would you maybe just lift your voice to him? Let's remind ourselves who he is. Maybe you'd say something like this, say, Lord, I believe. God, I believe you are the creator. You're so good. You're so merciful. I believe you are the healer. I believe you're the sustainer of life. I believe you are the sanctifier. I believe you are the protector. I believe you are the provider. But Lord, today, more than just believing you are, I confess that you are my healer. I choose you today. I choose to put my trust in you today to receive you as my healer, as my savior, as my protector, as my shepherd, as my friend, as my savior. Lord, today I put my trust in you. I believe, Jesus, you truly are the son of the living today doesn't matter what happened yesterday I surrender all that to you I simply today acknowledge I need you now thank you for forgiving me of my sins and thank you that as I put my trust in you you promise not to reject me but to receive me as a son as a daughter and today I put my trust in you completely from this day forward Fill me with your spirit that I can live the overcoming life saying no to sin and saying yes to you, Jesus. Lord, may you be glorified in my life for eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.